evening, everyone. Thank you for the privilege once again. Uh, so back home at uh, my church, I'm taking us through the book of Genesis. Um, and so we divided Genesis up into sections, uh, the first section being Genesis chapter 1 and 2. And so within Genesis chapter 1 and 2, uh, we are creating sort of little sub-series from uh, our overview of Genesis 1 and 2. Um, one sermon was on creation, and we had a look at the creation narrative and the poetic structure of Genesis. And then uh, also we had a look at uh, the creation of man, which is what I'll be dealing with you uh, along with you tonight, uh, and, and a few other topics that we try to extract from the book of Genesis. Now, as mentioned tonight, we'll be looking at the creation of man. And so we need to ask ourselves two very important questions. What am I and who am I? And if I can bring that question to the floor and ask you, how would you answer that question about yourself? What are you and who are you? What would you say? Anyone? I just got the YouTube video there. <laughs> okay. Sorry, yes. What are you? What am I? Who am I? How would you answer that about yourself? I'm, well, I'm interested in the creation of God. You're a person? Created okay. By Created by God. Perfect. Yeah, yeah, of course, glory. Yeah, it's good. I want to say I'm not going on until someone answers. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, I could say I am a white. <laughs> straight or heterosexual Protestant <laughs> male. <laughs> identifies as EU. Yeah, EU. Identifies as dude dad. <laughs> That's your pronouns, dude dad. Okay. So those two questions, what am I, who am I, are the most fundamental questions any person can ask about themselves. This question, these two questions are crucial, whether you are saved or unsaved, whether you are a Christian or a heathen, whether you are an atheist or agnostic, no matter who you are, these two questions, what am I and who am I, remain fundamental. The reason is, how you answer those two questions reveal your entire world view. And it also indicates by what your worldview or by who your worldview was shaped. Your worldview is that thing through which you interpret the entire world, everyone and everything around you. The reason these two questions are so utterly important is because it reveals what we think our purpose is and what we find our identity in. The way you answer those two questions, what am I, who am I, the way you answer them reveals what you think your purpose is and what you find your identity. If we were to go back 80 years and we were to give these two questions to a man by the name of Adolf Hitler, what am I, who am I, what are you, who are you, he would most probably answer these two questions in the following way. I am the leader, and I am superior. You see, Hitler not only believed that about himself, but he also believed that about the supermajority, and he also led the supermajority of the German nation to believe that about themselves. When Hitler took over the government in 1931, uh, he didn't take long for him to start all types of massive projects within the nation of Germany. One of these nationwide projects was a fumigation project. And so what he would do is he issued a mandate that every factory or massive building in Germany had to be fumigated. You see, Hitler was a bit of what we would call today a germaphobe. He was obsessed with creating order and creating and bringing cleanliness. And so he issued that mandate to have all the factories in Germany fumigated. And so the gas that they used for the fumigation was this gas called Zyklon A 
And your cyclone A was a bit chemically altered so that it would have a distinct odor to it. So that whenever you walked into a factory or a building that was under fumigation, you could instantly smell it and know you were supposed to get out because you were busy inhaling a cyanide-based gas that could kill you. And so that project was a massive success. And you see, sometime after that, in fact, it didn't take, take long for Hitler to eventually start another project, a, a project in which he would uh, gather up everyone he called an undesirable. An undesirable within Germany were those Jews, gypsies, and homosexuals, and everyone else Hitler deemed lesser than the Germans. And he would take them, and he would start an, another fumigation project. He would go and put them in gas chambers. Uh, he, in fact, he even used the same gas that he used for killing rats and insects, he used on them. The only difference is this gas was called Zyklon B. The difference is that it was chemically altered not to have that odor, so that they would not know that they were busy inhaling a cyanide-based gas. And so Hitler eventually killed millions of people that he called undesirables. He was just cleaning his country. He was fumigating the nation from rats and insects and also some Jews and gypsies. If you were to ask him, don't you feel bad about all the people that you murdered? The response would simply be, no, I, I didn't murder anyone. I just got rid of some pests, some parasites. And so you see, the way we answer those two questions reveal our worldview. You see why those two questions are so fundamental to our identity and our whole worldview. What am I? Who am I? And so, depending on who you ask those two questions to and how they have been influenced, you will get a multitude of different answers to those two questions. So, I would once again bring the question to you. How would you say, what do you think, what have you heard outside in the world, how would people answer those two questions? People who are unbelieving non-Christians. How would they answer, what am I, who am I? What would you say? Once again. Oh, sorry. I am a God. I am a God. Yes, yeah, that's some some pretend to be some explicitly say they are yeah that's true i am a god yeah they even they definitely behave and live like they believe that yeah uh, they also probably say they're untouchable untouchable yeah and and how we hear that normally in the sense of don't judge me yeah. well why not what makes you suspicious um but that's exactly it yeah maybe another example Yes. A good person. Good person, yeah. They identify that I'm a good person. Well, based on what? Well, based on themselves, you know, they did their own measure. So, yeah, that's definitely it. So, depending on what their worldview have been influenced by, you will get all types of different answers. So, let me give you some of the most common answers and the most widest sweeping umbrella answers. Some would say, that we are nothing more than biological machines. We all have heard that before, right? In fact, that's what we children from gay high are taught to believe in school. You are nothing more than a biological machine. The only difference between you and your dog, they would say, is that you're lucky enough to have a bigger brain and that you're, because of that, able to manipulate your environment around you to better serve your needs. It is interesting that it is normally from this group of people that we hear these movements of people who say the world needs to be depopulated, the world is overpopulated, humans bear no good significance to the world, we only do damage, we need to get rid of all humans. It's normally those type of people who say that. But I always find it interesting that they never start with themselves when it comes to implementing their solutions. It's always other people who need to be depopulated. Some would answer those two questions, what am I, who am I, by completely identifying themselves by terms of their sex or their gender. Sex being their biological makeup and gender of the social constructs that we have in our society today. Have you ever wondered why homosexual people who strongly identify with the LGBTQ plus movement 
takes so much offense when you even hint towards homosexuality being a sin. Have you ever wondered why they take so much offense? A, a, a man can divorce his wife, and when he's thought to be a sinner, he might be insulted, but he won't react the same way towards a homosexual person when they are told that homosexuality is a sin. The reason for that is they build their entire identity around their sexual orientation. Their entire identity is their sexual orientation. They are not just someone who is practicing homosexual, they are homosexual. And so if you come and you say, listen, in the most loving, compassionate, gentle, softest voice you possibly can and should, and you just try to reach out with them, and you say, listen, this is something you can stop and must stop, and you must glorify God. What you say is, listen, stop it, turn to Christ. What they hear is, you are saying that what I am is a mistake. Because they identify themselves with their sexual orientation. That's why we must be very wise. And we must help them make that distinction. Listen, you are not your sexual orientation. It's part of who you are. It's not your entire being. If it was, it's really shallow. We must help them make that distinction. But as long as they identify with their sexual orientation, they will take the greatest offense towards you suggesting that their existence is a mistake. And we know it's not true. We know their existence is not a mistake. But that is how they interpret our interactions. Some would then answer those two questions. What am I? Who am I? Based solely on their race. You see, for these people, everything is about race. And the struggle between races. In this world, nothing matters about you apart from your race. That's it. That is what they would say. We see this all the more in South Africa, like it's been for a long time. But more and more abroad, this is becoming the mainstream. It's no longer about the content of your character, but it's about the amount of melanin in your, on your skin. And so this is the worldview that was used to justify all types of evil, like slavery and genocide. Well, slavery is a sin. Well, no, it's not, because you see, they're not really human like we are. Or they have the image of God, but to a lesser extent. And there are more examples that I can give you, but for the sake of time, let's go on. And so let me ask you now another question. There are all these different ways to answer those two questions. What am I? Who am I? What is the best way to answer those questions? Or say it in a, another way. What's the right way in which we should answer those questions? Based on what can we as Christians confront the world with those two questions? What did you say? Let me give you a hint. <laughs> the Bible. <laughs> Here we go. With so many different worldviews and different ways to answer those two questions, how do we know the best answers or the right answers? Well, to, there's an answer to that question. It's a quite simple answer. Since God is the one who created us, He is the one who programmed within us purpose and identity. So, we simply need to read the instruction manual left for us by the designer, the Bible. So, Without then spending any more time on introductory thoughts, let's take a look at God's Word and see how God would answer those two questions. What does God say you are? Who does God say you are? And so let's quickly read Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1, at, starting at verse 26. We're reading from the sixth day of creation. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. Okay. Then God said, Let us make man in our image, 
after our likeness and let him have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And God said, God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of the earth and every tree with seed in its fruit, and you shall have them for food. And to every beast on the earth, and to every bird uh, in the heavens, and to every creeping thing on the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. And also read with me Genesis 2, starting at verse 4. These are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. When no bush of the field was yet in the land, and no small plant of the field had yet sprung up, for the Lord had not caused it to rain on the land, and there was no man to work the ground, and a mist was coming up, uh, and a mist was going up from the land and was watering the whole face of the ground. Then the Lord God formed the man of the dust from the ground, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living creature. And then also read with me Genesis chapter 2 verse 18. Then the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. Now out of the ground the Lord God had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought, to, brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all the livestock and to all the birds of the heavens and to every beast of the field. But for Adam there was not found a helper fit for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. And while he slept, took one of his ribs and closed up the place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, This at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. Therefore a man shall leave his father and his mother and will pass to his wife. They shall become one flesh, and the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. So, Genesis chapter 1 to 3 is what we can call poetic history. You see, Genesis chapter 1 to 3 is not a myth. It is not fable. It is not allegory. It is not symbolism. It is true history but written in a poetic manner so as to creatively emphasize certain truths and creatively outline the creation narrative for us. Genesis chapter 1 is a wide-angled view of the account of the creation of the heavens and earth. With Genesis chapter 2, we zoom in on the sixth day to see in detail what God did specifically on the sixth day. Genesis chapter 1 is a wide-angle view. In Genesis chapter 2, we zoom in on the sixth day. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 to 28, we see God create all the animals and humans. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 7 and 2, verse 19, we see that both Adam and the animals were formed on the same day and in the same way. Both were formed from the dust or ground of the earth. The only difference between Adam and the animals is that Adam was created in God's image. Or in the words of Genesis chapter 2, God breathed into Adam. That is something God did not do with any other part of his creation. Only in Adam did God breathe. Something that's completely unique and special only to humanity. You see, Adam is referred to in Genesis chapter 1 as being made in God's image. This is what we would call in Latin, or the theological term, is the Imago Dei. I'm sure some of you have probably heard of it. The Imago Dei is the Latin or theological term for what we see happening in Genesis chapter 1 and 2. God creating man and woman in his own image, or Genesis 2, God breathing into Adam. So as a shorthand, when I'm speaking of the Imago Dei, I'm simply referring to God's image 
that is in us. So we see that God bestows this unique blessing on humanity that none of the rest of creation receives. In fact, not even angels are ever mentioned to be created in the image of God. Only humanity. Only us. Only Adam and Eve. But what does it exactly mean to be created in the image of God? What does the Imago Dei mean? What do we mean when we say we exist in the image of God? Well, let me start by, by telling you what it does not mean. Okay? The image of God or the Imago Dei has nothing to do with our physical appearance. Some would say that it means that we exist in the form or shape that God exists as his image bearers. But that's not true. In many places in the Bible, especially in John chapter 4, we learn that God is spirit. God is outside the realm of matter and space in time. What we have as a three-dimensional world, God is outside of those three dimensions. God is spirit. But also, if you want to make the argument that the image of God simply refers to our, uh, our form, that means that the monkeys and the apes and the chimpanzees are also made in the image of God because we share the exact and we share exact anthropomorphic features with them. Also, if we say that the image of God simply refers to our physical appearance, what does that mean about deformed people? Does it mean that they are less in the image of God than we are? We know that's not true. And also, if the image of God simply refers to our physical appearance. What would the implications be on race relationships? Does one race look more like the image of God than another race? Many throughout history have used that to justify atrocities. So the Imago Dei, or being created in the image of God, is actually not one thing. It's a combination of a few things. We have a range of qualities and responsibilities that God bestowed on us. The image of God is a range of qualities and responsibilities that God has bestowed on us. This first range of qualities, some call them, the fancy theological word is substantive qualities. You can just maybe throw that in your next conversation and impress someone. Okay? The substantive qualities. Simply what that means is that we have intelligence, we have a sense of morality, rationality, and creativity. However, to say that these four things, intelligence, morality, rationality, and creativity, make up the whole image of God would also be wrong. The reason is... We, that is only a part of what it means to be uh, created in the image of God. The more we study and learn about animals, the more we discover that animals actually show greater amounts of intelligence and rationality than we at first perceived. Some animals show amazing capabilities of solving problems. In fact, some studies have even shown that primates exhibit great creative capability and even abilities to entertain themselves and others through means of acting strange or using objects. In fact, even in some animalistic societies, in fact, there was a colony of chimps that was studied, they saw that there was some form of morality structure among them, where they would punish a greedy chimp when he acted against the interests of his colony. Humans, however, do have a heightened awareness of these qualities. That is where we are different from the animals. We have all these attributes, intelligence, sense of morality, rationality, and creativity, but to a much greater extent than anything you will see in the animal kingdom. When was the last time you saw a sculpture or a Mona Lisa made by ants? We must attribute our higher sense of these substantive qualities, intelligence, rationality, mora morality, and creativity. We must attribute our higher awareness of these things to God's breathing into us. Because God is intelligent, rational, has his, he is morality, he is the standard of morality, and he is creative. Just read Genesis chapter 1 to see how creative 
God is. So his breathing into us definitely set us apart. His creating us in his image set us apart from all the other animals. But if we stop there, if we say that is what it means to be made in the image of God, to be have a higher awareness and a higher form of intelligence, rationality, creativity, and morality, if that's where we stop, we are nothing more than a higher form of animals, which is exactly what the evolutionists say we are. Uh, because that's not what it means to be created in the image of God. It's simply a part of it. Genesis teaches us more, in fact. To be made in the image of God carries with it a form of supernatural election. Being made in the image of God carries with it a form of supernatural election. That is what it means to be created in the image of God. Sorry, should I just wait for this? Let me repeat that for a third time. Being made in the image of God means and it carries with it a form of supernatural election. What do I mean by that? Well, humans and animals were created on the same day. We don't even get our own day. We are created on the sixth day with animals. And humans and animals are created in the same way. Both are taken from the ground and formed by God. We are not even formed in a unique way, except for women. That's why they're so special. The only difference... Got some points now, no? <laughs> Just wish my wife was here. <laughs> the only difference between us and the animals who were formed on the same day and in the same way and in the same manner, the only difference between us and them is that God breathed into Adam. And just Adam. He didn't do that with any of the rest of the animals. So in a sense, God chose Adam. He separated Adam from the rest of the animals by breathing into him. In fact, you can make the argument, up until the time that God breathed into Adam, Adam was exactly the same like the rest of the animals. Because all animals were created in the same, on the same day, in the same way, and in the same manner. But God set Adam apart. How? By breathing into him. By placing his image into Adam. So God elected Adam apart from the animals. And this theme of election is a major theme throughout the book of Genesis. Just as God elected Adam apart from the rest of the animals... So he elected Noah apart from all the other peoples of the world. Just as he elected Abraham from all the other peoples in the Middle East. He elected Isaac apart from Ishmael. He elected Jacob apart from Esau. And eventually we end the book of Genesis by God electing the nation of Israel above and apart from all the other nations of the world. So this theme of election is from the beginning to the end in the book of Genesis. And it starts with God electing Adam apart from all the other animals. So in summary, to be made in the image of God is to be graciously and supernaturally elected. But now, another question arises. Elected for what? Good question. I'm glad you asked it. <laughs> we are elected to be God's representatives. We are elected to be God's representatives here on earth. Read with me Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. Then God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. We see there that God creates man, and then delegates authority to him to rule the earth. From the fish in the sea, as low as you can get, to the birds in the heavens, as high as you can go. God delegated authority, sovereignty, to man. Let him have dominion over all the earth. God delegates that. Question. Was it possible for God to have sole authority over the earth? Could he have ruled the earth by himself alone? Of 
course he could. He created the whole universe. What's a tiny speck of dust in the grand scheme of the universe? He could have easily done it. But he chose to give that to Adam as his representative. He gave that delegated authority to Adam to rule on God's behalf, to work with God in this grand project. Now, if that sounds strange to you, think of our New Testament equivalent that we have. Our New Testament equivalent. Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 to 20. We're not going to read it. But what happens is just before Jesus ascends into heaven, he says, go therefore and make disciples. Could Jesus not have made disciples on his own? Of course he could. He can make the chair, the, the trees, and the rocks, and the mountains preach the gospel. He can send an angel to fly over the heavens like he does in Revelation chapter 14 and proclaim the gospel so that the whole world can hear it at once. He could have done it, but he chose to work with humanity, to partner with his creation, the disciples, in building his church. And that is what we see here. God partners with Adam as Adam is his representative to have dominion over all the earth, over all, nation, over all nature. And so we don't have time for this, but maybe when I come back, when we look at the creation account in Genesis chapter 1 sometime in the future, I'll show you that Genesis chapter 1 is actually written in the same way as to ordain a temple. It is, has this massive temple motif to it. Genesis chapter 1 is written in the same way and uses the same language. And I'll show you from other parts of the Old Testament as if God is busy creating his tabernacle in which he will reveal his presence in. <coughs> but we'll take, I did a sermon on that on YouTube that you can maybe look if you're interested in doing that. But so he creates this temple, this cosmic temple in which he decided to reveal himself in. And in, on the crescendo of his creation, on the sixth day, he creates Adam and Eve, his representatives. His, in a sense, those who represent him. And what do we call someone who represents God? Another word for it? It's a priest. It's, it's a priest. And the priest motif is also found throughout all of Moses' writings. Again, we don't have time. But Noah, Abraham, his children, up until Moses and Aaron, this priest motif is constantly recycled in the narratives that Moses writes. And if you doubt this concept of repeated themes, let me give you an example. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 4, we have this phrase, and these are the generations of. And that phrase is repeated in Genesis 5, verse 1, Genesis 6, verse 9, Genesis 10, verse 1, Genesis 25, verse 19, and five other times throughout the book of Genesis. You see, Genesis loves, Moses loves to repeat or recycle themes. He does it to emphasize certain points. And the priest motif is one of those themes. And so Adam and Eve are made by God to represent him, to have authority on his behalf, to represent him in all of creation. But we'll get back to that now shortly. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 15, we read this. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and to keep it. Those words, to work, in the original Hebrew, it has the idea of serving. Of serving. In a sense, it's to work for the ground. It's not so much to work to work the ground, but to work for the ground. Adam was made to serve the ground. And that other word that we read, to work and to keep, keep is better translated as to guard or to protect. So in summary, God made humanity to serve and to protect and to keep the earth. Doesn't that make sense? In fact, that actually echoes what we read in Genesis chapter 1 verse 2. Genesis chapter 1 verse 2. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. That word there, hovering, hovering is such a bad translation, because that word hovering, it's the same word that's used in Isaiah of a mother chicken, and then again of a mother eagle that coosters, that cuddles her chicklets. So it's not this abstract spirit hovering over the water just as in presence, but it's the Holy Spirit Cuddling the earth, bringing it close to him, showing it's his precious possession. 
And so just as the Holy Spirit keeps the earth close to him, as a, as a chicken would do over chicklets or an eagle would do over eggs, like Isaiah uses the exact same word for that, just like that, so Adam and Eve is made to serve and to keep and guard the earth as God's representatives. Notice this. This that we just read now, Genesis 2 verse 15, to keep and to guard, this was before the fall. The fall that happens in Genesis chapter 3, when Adam and Eve falls into the sin, this was before the fall. And another observation. God could have made the world perfect in the sense that nothing needed to be done. God could have created the world in a state where everything was already set in place. But he did it. He created everything, and then he tasks Adam and Eve to get to work, to cultivate it, to make it better, to grow. And there's a reason that throughout Genesis chapter 1, the word good is repeated. And it was good, and it was good, and it was good. And on the sixth day, it was very good. Why not perfect? The Hebrew has a word for perfect. In fact, it's used. In, it, the Psalms are full of that word perfect. But Moses decided to use the word good. Good for a reason. Because Adam and Eve was made to work the ground. To work alongside God on this grand project. Could God not have made it perfect to begin with? Of course he could. That's what he's going to do in the last days when he ushers in the new creation, the new heavens and the new earth. But he made everything good so that Adam and Eve can now join him, work alongside him, to work the ground, to serve it, to keep it, and to protect it. Once again, it's the same in the New Testament with Jesus partnering with his church. He does not need us, but he decided to glorify himself through using us, working alongside us and with us. Genesis chapter 2, verse 19. Now out of the ground the Lord had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. This is actually so profound because up until this point, the only person who named creation was God. The only person who up until that point named creation was God. Genesis 1 verse 5. And God called the light day and the darkness he called night. 1 verse 8. And God called the expanse heaven. 1 verse 10. God called the dry land earth and the waters uh, that were gathered together he called seas. So for the first time we see someone apart from God naming creation. And whatever the man called the living creature, that was its name. That last clause, that was its name, we should take that to mean that whatever Adam called, called the creature, God abided by it. God was happy with the name that Adam gave to the creature. And that's so profound because it shows us that Adam is acting as God's representative by now participating in the naming of God's creation. It's profound, right? So just me. So in conclusion then, what does it mean to be created in the image of God? What does the Imago Dei mean? It means that in a sense we have a higher form of intelligence, a rationality, moral awareness and creativity. But more than that, it also means that we act as God's representatives on earth. We share in the responsibility of caring for and sustaining the work of creation. And so since we act as God's biological priest in creation, it means that we, in a sense, in a limited sense, share in some of the divine attributes that God has. Those we call God's communicable attributes. For example, God is a God of love. We who are created in His image have the ability to love. It's built within us. Even the world who hates God knows that love is a good thing. God is a God of truth. That's the reason why we do not trust and despise people who cannot live in the light. 
we desire truth. This is an interesting one. God is an eternal God. Unlike God, we have a starting point, right? All of us had a beginning point. God had no beginning point. He always was. But just like God, we do not have an ending. All of us will live forever. The only question is where? Heaven or on hell? In heaven or in hell? But all of us will live forever. Just like God, we will never end. We share in God's authority and His sovereignty, not His completed, but His delegated authority that He gave to Adam and Eve to have dominion over the earth and to rule it. We share in God's creativity. All of us love creativity. That's why we love a good movie or a good book or a good dish or, or just good food. Think about this. Think of how amazingly loving, gracious, and creative God is. That He gave us a tongue that could taste. He could have just made us as creatures that need to intake sustenance to nourish our bodies, and that's it. But he gave us a tongue so that we can taste chocolate and coffee and good things. Oh, the grace and the love of God, that he does that for us. He is so creative and loving. And as already mentioned, we also share in God's rationality. We have the ability to solve problems, to think rationally. And so the Imago Day made Adam a representative. It made Adam a priest. But it also made Adam a mediator. A mediator. What's a mediator? A mediator is someone who acts between two parties, right? And so Adam was made from the dust of the ground, but breathed into him was life from God. He is a creation both from the natural world and the divine world. He is both from the natural realm and the divine realm. Adam was made from the earth as a representative of earth, but God breathed into him his own breath so that he could act as a representative of God to the earth. This is the reason why Paul refers to Adam as a type of mediator. When he refers to Christ, Paul speaks of Christ as the last Adam because Christ is the fulfillment of what Adam never could be a righteous head and a perfect mediator. So, do you see that? That the, the mediatory role of Adam as both natural and supernatural. It's also important to note that the Imago Day. This image of God stretches both to men and women that we read in Genesis chapter 1 verse 26. And in a sense, the image of God would have been incomplete if both men and women did not present, were present in creation. But that's a topic for a different time that maybe in the future we could look at. So what are the implications? Let me ask this to you. Since we are image bearers of God, since we are created in His image, we are His representatives we are as biological priests, mediators. What are the implications? What does it mean for us? What should we be doing as those made in the image of God here on earth? Any application that you can maybe think of? Well, as image bearers of God, it means that we share in the responsibility and authority to take care of God's creation. This means that the earth and the state of the earth should be of concern to us. Now, I've heard many pastors make comments like, I don't care about global warming, it's all going to burn up anyway, and I don't care about your political view of global warming and what you think. But we have a responsibility to take care of the earth. That was our original design. Our original function was to take care of God's creation, to keep it, to guard it, to work it, to serve it. In fact, let me give you an example of how seriously God takes this. The nation of Israel were given a commandment, a law, that they are to work the land for six years. And then on the seventh year, they are to let it rest. And so on the sixth year, God will give them a double crop so that that crop would sustain them for the sixth and the seventh year. 
And for 490 years, Israel did not obey that law of God. They worked the land for six years, received the double crop on the sixth year, and then they continued to work in the seventh year. And when God sent them into exile, He sent them away for 70 years, the exact amount of time that they robbed the land from its rest. We also read in Isaiah that God will pronounce judgment on the nation of Babylon for cutting down the trees of Jordan. As image bearers of God, we have a responsibility and a duty towards the animals and creatures of this world. Proverbs is full of the righteous and the wise taking care of their animals. We are to protect, to serve, and to care for our animals. They are not our accessories or our mere entertainment, but our privilege to care for. As image bearers, we are to be like God in practicing those attributes that we share with God. God is a God of love. We are to represent God in that way. God is a God of truth. We are to represent Him that way. God is a creative God. We are to honor and glorify Him in exercising our creative ability and so on. As image bearers of God, we ultimately reflect God. Do you wonder why God took so much offense in the Old Testament to the creation of idols and images that were worshipped? Have you ever wondered why He expressly forbids the creation of an image of Him in the Ten Commandments? The reason is, we are the image of God. We are the image of God. We are the living, breathing, thinking, and worshipping representations of the eternal, living, and glorious God. Unlike the gods of the nations, whose idols are made from wood and stone and can't do anything, our great and living God made living, breathing images of Himself. And images do what? Images are made to image. Okay? Haters gonna hate, images gonna image. <laughs> An image reflects something. An image points to something. An image represents something. You see, I have a picture of my wife in my wallet, and I appreciate and I love that picture, especially when I'm not in close proximity to her. But when I go home, I can go and sit on the couch of my picture. I put it away because the picture points to something better. We are the images of God. Have you ever wondered why in our society, Unlike any other point in the history of this world, especially in third or in first world countries, we have record high, staggering high statistics and numbers of young people who are committing suicide. Unlike anything we have ever seen before in the history of humanity. Staggering record numbers of young people who commit suicide. I want to argue that one of the many reasons for that is that since we are little, we are told to believe in yourself, trust in yourself. You're the one you're looking for. You are enough. Listen, if I'm the one I'm looking for, yeah, I don't even want to try. I know who I am. You don't have to convince me of how special I am. I always remember in primary school, we had this group come to us every Wednesday to teach us about the Bible, and they'll always say, oh, all of you are princes and princesses. And I always thought to myself, Listen, if everyone's a prince, no one's a prince. <laughs> and so, if I were to take you to the, to the Alps in Switzerland, those beautiful white mountains, gorgeous, glorious, and I take you, I pay for your ticket, I put you first class, I you know, pamper you all the way there, and just before you're about to, to see those beautiful mountains, I drop a room full of mirrors on top of you. And all you can see is yourself. What a downer that would be. You see yourself instead of those beautiful, glorious mountains. Listen, if we tell people that they should be looking at themselves instead of the one that they are representing, reflecting, we rob them of joy, of purpose, of happiness, of fulfillment, 
because they are made to point to something better, not themselves. Not themselves. As image bearers, it means that all people are precious to God. You are not the sum of your life choices. The summary of all your mistakes, your family history, your financial situation, your cultural context. You are precious for the sole reason that you are an image bearer of God, a representative, a mediator, the one who points to and reflects to God. So, no matter your race, all people are made as image bearers of God. It is because of this reason, because of Genesis chapter 2, that racism is not only intellectually flawed and dumb, but racism is heresy. It's false teaching. And it should be disciplined in churches like any other sin would be disciplined. Because racism is a refusal to believe that all men and women are created in the image of God. It's heresy. It contradicts Revelation chapter 7. It says, every tribe, every tongue, every nation will stand before the throne of God. And so, in closing, closing thoughts. Did we lose the image of God when Adam and Eve sinned? We know that we created an image of God before Genesis chapter 3. What now post Genesis chapter 3? Well, no, the image wasn't lost, but it is distorted. The image is not destroyed, it's just deformed. We see later in Genesis chapter 9, verse 6, after God destroys the world of the flood, he again repeats that we are created in his image, and it's because of that that man shall not shed man's blood. Also, James. James repeats that we are made in the image of God. That's because when we slander or speak badly about one another, we are slandering an image bearer, a representative of God. Also, Genesis chapter 5, verse 1 to 3, we're not going to read it for the sake of time, but there again it's repeated that we are made in the image of God. The passage starts with we are made in the image of God, and then the passage ends with Adam had a son in his own image. So it shows that the distorted image of Adam, who was originally created in the image of God, got passed on to his son. It's there, it's deformed. It's not destroyed, it's just distorted. And so, was Adam originally, uh, was Adam when he was originally made in the image of God, was he perfect? That's how we normally speak, right? When everything was perfect before the fall. Well, I would argue no. I would argue no, he wasn't perfect. It was good, but not perfect. Why? Well, a perfect being cannot stop being perfect. Otherwise, he was not perfect to begin with. Can God stop being perfect? Can he stop being God? No, it's impossible. God is a God who cannot change, a God who cannot lie. And so Adam wasn't perfect, but he, he was good. And so that brings us with a couple of other questions. And I'm not going to give you any resolution to these questions. This is so that you maybe invite me back next month. But the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. We often view that tree with suspicion when we read it. But we need to understand that when that tree was made, it was good. Because everything was good. Including the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Thus, having possession of the knowledge of good and evil in itself make you evil? No, it doesn't. Because Genesis chapter 3 verse 22. Then the Lord God said, Behold, man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil. God has the knowledge of good and evil. So just having possession of that knowledge doesn't make you evil, because God has possession of it, and He's good. He's light. Also, why, does, why is it the problem in Genesis chapter 3 verse 22? God says there's a problem. Man has become like one of us. But in Genesis chapter 1 verse 26, God says, let us make man in our image after our likeness. I thought that was the point. Why is it the problem now that man has become like God? Well, for that, you'll have to invite me back. <laughs> but what do we do with all of this? Well, I'm sure most of you know Genesis 50 verse 20. You meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. You see, Joseph spoke that to his brothers after everything they had done to him. But that verse is not just a summary for Joseph's story. That verse is a summary for the whole book of Genesis. 
because what happened in the Garden of Eden, what happened when Adam and Eve disobeyed God, you see, what's interesting for me is in, uh, in, God, in Eden, in the Garden, there were two trees. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil and the tree of life. After Adam and Eve sinned by eating of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, they were put out of the garden. And then we don't hear about the tree of the knowledge of good and evil ever again. But if we go to the end of our Bibles, Genesis chapter 21 and 22, what do we find? We find the tree of life again. It's there in the center of the new city of Jerusalem. Where's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? Well, I argue it served its purpose because the whole Bible happens because of that. And so what Adam and Eve meant for evil, God meant it for good. Just like Joseph says, that same act, that act of his brothers wanting to kill him and then selling them into slavery, they meant it for evil. But God used that same act of wanting to murder him, murder him and then sell him into slavery. God used that same act for good. Just like Adam and Eve, they wanted to usurp God. They believed the lies of the devil. They meant it for evil. But God meant it for good. Because now, what happens to us when we are safe? If you place your faith and your trust in Christ, what happens? You start the process of sanctification, right? What is sanctification? It's becoming like Jesus. It's becoming Christ-like. Colossians chapter 1 verse 15. Jesus is the image of the invisible God. He is the fulfillment of what Adam never could be. Romans chapter 8 verse 29. Again, the apostle Paul writes, For those whom he foreknew, he also be predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son. 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 15 Again, the Apostle Paul writes, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 48, As was the man of dust, so also are those who are of dust. As is the man of heaven, so also are those who are of heaven. Just as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of the man of heaven. So you see, we were created in the image of God to represent Him. But that image now, we can only be truly be conformed, be reformed into the image of God, by being conformed to the image of Christ. That is the grand project of human history. God is conforming humanity, the saints, into his image. And in the end, we will be like God. We will be with God. We won't be God. We will be his perfect images. Sinless, without any flaw, mistake, we shall see him, as John says, face to face. Something that Adam and Eve lost when they disobeyed. There's more I can say, much more. I skipped off of everything. But for the sake of time, let's leave it. Let's quickly pray. Lord, we are so thankful for this time and are thankful for the opportunity. Lord, I pray that you would take what was said in some small measure and work it into our hearts. Lord, I pray that you would conform us to your image, Lord, more and more every day. Amen.